So hello everybody um, to the uh, yeah last session of the uh, Deadwake Workshop Week, uh, the uh, uh, mappings uh, yeah task group. And uh, just in case you haven't heard it already, the notes document is in the chat. Um, and um, so we. We have a couple of things on the agenda for today, uh, but actually the one of the first uh, things we wanted to um, to start with was with the the introduction of uh, the SSSOM standard uh, by Raisa. She is not here yet, uh, so maybe before we uh, yeah uh, <laughs> while we wait, we we can make a, a short round of introductions. I think I know most of you. <laughs> Um, but but yeah, uh, maybe I just start and then since everybody is uh, having the the screens in a different order, I, I just call uh, on on you and uh, you can yeah introduce yourself. So hi, I'm Dave Schichtmüller. I work at the Botanic Garden Botanic Museum in Berlin, and uh, in Tedwig 2022 in Sofia, um, yeah, there were a lot of discussions on on mappings, and uh, so at some point, as I said, uh, that sounds like a topic that is yeah touched everywhere within uh, um, yeah that week. So I put it on the agenda for the unconference session, and um, a, a lot of people showed up, and there was a lot of lively discussion, and so this uh, task group was formed, and so I've been uh, involved with it uh, pretty much from the beginning. And um, yeah, if I'm not working on, on, on standards, I'm uh, uh, involved in various projects uh, 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 that the Botanic Garden is, is involved in. Um, but in Tedwig, I'm also um, uh, yeah uh, chair of the um, ABCD maintenance group. Uh, Stan, you are the first in my order. Um, I'm Stan Bloom. I'm uh, retired from the California Academy of Sciences um, and um, working as kind of the administrator of the Tedwig Secretariat, doing lots of uh, web mailing list, budget, blah, blah, whatever, all those kinds of things. Um, and very interested in, in seeing how mappings can be applied to our processes and uh, res, you know, sort of reconciliation of semantics across all of our different standards. Thank you. Hannah? There. So, hi, I'm Hannah Goibola. Um, I used to be a TAD Vicker from early on, and, and I used to work as a Finnish uh, GBIF node manager. Uh, currently, I work at the CSC IT Center for Science, which is a company uh, owned by government and higher education uh, in Finland, and it's a non-profit, so we produce um, research data management services for for um, universities and research institutes. And uh, currently, my field is uh, taking care of interoperability issues with uh, natural environment data. So this very much interests me, and this is why I participated in Hopper into the um, br making bridges. What was it called? The workshop? The session bridging between standards. Yes. And, and uh, I, I was presenting there um, my colleagues work. Uh, they are working with uh, a project called FECO for EOSC and, and um, creating um, kind of a metadata crosswalk and, and standards. Uh, kind of a bridging or mapping tool and also a registry where you can publish these, these um, mappings and crosswalks. Uh, and they are, they explain to me, they are different things. So, so these crosswalks are practical uh, implementations of mappings between two dedicated sets of, of data. And, and uh, yeah, so, so it interests me and, and I would be, particularly happy if we could talk about also uh, creating these mappings and crosswalks between Tarvik standards and outside world standards. Uh, and also if we can come up with uh, an idea, what is the minimum metadata for 
A, schemas, and then B, also these uh, mappings uh, in whatever format they may be. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Patricia? Yeah. Hello, I'm Patricia Mergen from uh, Mass Botanical Garden and Roy Museum for Central Africa. Uh, I've been involved in TEDWIC since 2002. And I was involved a long time ago also uh, in mappings between Darwin Core and ABCD already in early years. Later, I was also touching a bit when we looked into the molecular standards with uh, GGBN, so that's an outside standard, and uh, ABCD DNA and also Darwin Core, recently also Earth Sciences standards. I'm also, like Hannah, involved in EOSC for Belgium and also in the EOSC Association. And I'm totally agreeing that it's important that we also see to map or collaborate uh, with other standards, the Research Data Alliance and so on. Uh, for TEDWIG, I'm currently chair of the fundraising and partnerships. And actually there I already suggested an eventual partnerships with uh, the colleagues of the Deanaquanet network that participated in the past to uh, to Tedwick also, uh, who have now a standard that is more ISO standards on methods, not so much on data, but where we also see that it would be good to to collaborate, and they also want to make it open that it's not just a closed ISO standard, but they have a parallel thing going on so that it's also open to the rest of the world for whom ISO standards are too expensive. And I like this approach. And uh, in this group, I think it would be interesting to discuss uh, for other ISO standards in our domains, if we could not also have such an approach, because um, we are often contacted if our standards, we won't make them ISO which we don't want because we don't want our users to have to pay or that they become too limitative. So I could find this example interesting to have both, both worlds and find a solution because the European Commission, if they want to accept it, you can't get around to make an ISO standard else they will not accept them in their law, but then it reduces the users. And so you can somehow try to to have both worlds. So we can discuss this later, this example, and see if it can be useful for us. Okay, thank you. Uh, ben? Um, I, I'm Ben Norton. I'm, I'm chair of the technical architecture group and co-convener of mineralogy and a couple other other things. And and I worked, uh, we just about finished uh, the Latimer core uh, review process ratification. I have two edits left of a piece of paper. And <laughs> once it's submitted, it should be it. So, and, and we added SCOS mappings in um, on the documentation pages. And so, although I, I realized this morning, it, they were tricky to design. I need to redesign a little bit because something wasn't obvious, but they are there. And so part of the issue is here, how do you present these things to make them useful? We actually went through three iterations of different ways of presenting SCOS mappings that we ended up with the current iteration, but it's not perfect. And so, um, but interested in all those sorts of details and so. Okay, yeah, uh, Matthias. Hi, I'm Matthias Dillon from Mijs Botanic Garden, uh, as well as Patricia in uh, Belgium. Um, I've been involved in a few task groups in TEDBIC, but my main interest here is because I've been quite involved in the MITS, the Minimum Information for Digital Specimens standard, and there we want to make use of mapping to make the calculation of MITS levels possible in combination with various data standards from the field. So seeing this work in this task group is going to be very interesting. I was also at the uh, the UN conference that David mentioned, and that also has some consequences because there indeed are also quite some overlaps between mapping between ABCD and Darwin Core and uh, the Latin Core approach as well. Yeah, thank you. Asper? <laughs> Hi, Elspeth Haston from the Royal Botanic Garden, Edinburgh, and um, along with Kat leading the, Kat Chapman leading the um, MIDS task group. And yeah, as working with Matthias and Sam, looking at the mapping as well, 
Um, so interested from that side for further mids, particularly. Uh, your turn. Mm -hmm. I'm Jutta Buschbaum. I'm um, located in Hamburg. Uh, however, I work at the NHM in London currently as a data architect. Um, I'm in Tadbeg. I'm a member of Flotimo Core. Um, as Ben just said, we are closing in on, uh, yeah, on making this milestone. Um, I also have been at in a, at Sophia um, when the end conference uh, started this task group. Um, otherwise, so my interest in mapping is that um, by background I'm a population geneticist and I'm interested in um, global monitoring, especially for species that have very wide distributions, um, like trees or microorganisms. And so you will need to merge data from a lot of sources. And that is why I got interested in doing um, infrastructure building, which is core for, for monitoring. Um, but, um, now I lost my thread. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh. Yeah, well, yeah, so anyway, <laughs> yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, okay, I, I just <laughs> hand over to the next person. Yeah, uh, Caitlin. Hi, I'm Caitlin. I work at the Museum for Naturkunde or the Natural History Museum in Berlin. And I'm a data manager there. So I work with lots of different standards and mapping between um, not just TEDWIG standards, but in and out of TEDWIG to other standards um, as part of my job normally. So, yeah, I was at the first meeting in Sofia as well. So I wanted to join again today. Oh, great. Uh, Isa, you are next on my screen. Yeah, of course. Let me just move you down so that I actually look at you. Um, so my name is Raisa Maya. I'm a PhD student at the Alfred Wegener Institute in Germany. Um, and I was one of the co-conveners actually of the Sustainable Darwin Core Mixed Interoperability Group, where we had the aim to map those two standards to each other and ensure that we have interoperability between the two. Um, and I'm also going to talk a bit more about that soon. I'm also um, part of the TED Wake Tag and some other uh, just global initiatives of bringing omics and biodiversity uh, data together and make that a bit more harmonized. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Stefan? We cannot hear you. Oh, okay. Apparently there's an, there's an audio issue. <laughs> Maybe we can we can uh, continue with somebody else, and, and if if you get your audio, uh, then you can. It's not working. Ah, it's it's working now. It's working now. It's working now. Yeah. Okay. Hey, thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I'm Stefan. I'm from the SNSB in Munich, and I'm at the head of the IT center, and I'm interested in the, all of the standards because we have a very a huge collection of everything, nearly, and natural history. Our collections and we need to get uh, or keep our pipelines to cheap if and other aggregators running that's why we need uh mappings to different standards okay thank you jen uh hello um my name is jen bayer i work for the u.s geological survey i'm in uh, hood river oregon on the west coast of of oregon or near the coast. Um, I lead a intergovernmental partnership in Northwest America um, with mostly USA, but also Canada, 
where we're bringing together states, tribes, and federal agencies to collaborate around monitoring. And a lot of it's driven um, related to endangered animals, mostly fishes. So there's a lot of um, aquatic organism and environmental data. And we've been doing all this work for quite a while, um, largely from an endangered species approach. And it's really driven by management decisions. Uh, and it's, um, how do, shall I say, it's, it's a different, we're, we're exploring how to do better with managing data and making it available and trying to ensure interoperability um, when we make data available for multiple providers. And so I'm basically a newcomer to this world. I've been following along with TEDWIG and standards for years. We're trying to figure out how do, how do we adopt and adapt um, to be part of this other bigger universe, I guess. Um, so when we say we have a standard that's aligned with what is an international standard. And uh, anyway, so I'm, I'm a newbie and I'm here to listen and learn. Thanks. Okay, well, welcome to the community. Jason. Hello, my name is Jason Best. I'm Director of Biodiversity Informatics at the Botanical Research Institute of Texas. Um, I joined this group a uh, little while back when I first learned about it, primarily because we have a number of collections, primarily herbarium, but also biorepository, living collections, library and archives. And we're working on a project where we'll need to be able to map um, our, our archival collections, primarily field images, to the uh, to herbarium collections and another platform. So primarily interested in being able to map from Darwin Core to Dublin Core and other local metadata schema. Okay, thank you. Um, Kim, you're next. Hi all, I'm Kim Watson from the New York Botanical Garden in Bronx, New York. I'm the Assistant Director of Biodiversity Information Management there which is to say I manage our uh, collections management system for our herbarium collection. We have separate uh, living collection and library archives collections and new to this group entirely first meeting here in a learning um, information gathering capacity and how we may benefit from the standards that derive. Oh, okay, great. Uh, Terry. Mm -hmm. Hi, hello. Um, thanks. So I'm Terry Ung. I'm a researcher in biogeography at the Paris Museum. And I'm currently the TEDx secretary and I'm working with Stan with doing all this administrative as, as, as much as I can, but Stan is doing all, most of it. Um, I'm very much interested in learning and following up what's happening in this group um, as part of my, my job in TEDx. Thank you. No, thank you. Uh, Luz, uh, you just just came in at the end of the introduction round. Uh, you want to quickly introduce yourself to the group? Uh, okay, my name is Luz Gomez, also from Colombia, uh, and I work with a collection of flies, uh, or the flies of importance in forensic science. Okay, thank you. Thank uh, you. <laughs> Uh, so well, we now have like a, a good overview of who's here and what are our skills uh, and uh, abilities. And uh, um, so, uh, yeah, without further ado, uh, I would hand over to Raisa uh, to present our first main agenda item for today. Thank you very much. I'll just try and share my screen. Oh, uh, could you enable... Ben, you, need, you need to allow that. Okay, let me try again. Oh, that's much better. Okay. Share. And then please let me know if you can see my screen now. Yeah, uh, okay. looks great. And does it progress or advance? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Well, then, thank you very much. Um, yeah, and also thank you, David, for uh, the, the invitation to um, kind of give you a bit of a primer to uh, the triple SOM or SSSOM, but I always feel like triple SOM is a bit easier. 
um, <laughs> a standard for mapping between different standards. And I'm going to talk about this in the context of the work that we've done um, in the sustainable um, interoperability working group for Davenport and mixes. So it's in a, um, I'll also give a bit of background or a bit more information on some of the things that we addressed besides just producing the mapping to make sure that we really are bringing the standards communities here together. Um, and I'm presenting this on behalf of the entire task group. This, the work that we've done has been concluded since, um, but yeah, it's just great to see um, that this will maybe evolve in something more or it can help inform the decisions you're going to be making down the way. Okay, um, so just to introduce you a bit to um, the standards that I've been working with, um, I'm working in the field of omics biodiversity data. And so the problem here was that we have two separate metadata specifications, one coming from the field of biodiversity and the other one coming from the field of omics. Um, and so the one from biodiversity, I assume many of you are aware of, which is the Ted Wake Darwin Force Standard. And then we also have on the omics side, the Genomic Standards Consortium, which produces its own standard, the MIXA standard. And both of those standards are then in turn, again, used by different infrastructures, which um, in include the data uh, that we're talking about. Let me just, sorry, I feel like, I'm getting a call. Let me just turn that off. Okay, sorry, I'm back. <laughs> um, okay, and so the problem here was that we don't only have the interoperability issue or the lack of interoperability between the metadata standards, but then also between the data that is deposited in the data, data databases. Um, and there were already groups such as GBIF who were trying to address this at the time where we started our task group. And so we, of course, made sure um, to then not only get GBIF around the table, but also um, some of the data infrastructures who are using the standard, uh, representatives from the standards themselves, data producers and data users in our task group, uh, so that we have a very holistic overview of what is needed um, and where any issues might arise when while we're developing this mapping and everything around it. And so uh, the main aims was to create and complete a mapping from Darwin Core to Mixes. So I think that is the most relevant here. And then um, throughout the work that we did, we also realized that we needed an extension because some of the terms could not be mapped. And then we also saw a huge um, opportunity of um, not only creating the mapping, but also making sure that there's a communication line being formed between the standards organizations. And we addressed that um, by creating a memorandum of understanding between the two standards organizations. Okay, but first of all, let's get into the mapping. Um, and we were not only thinking about, well, or well, I guess the question first was, what does a mapping really mean? And to us, that meant we wanted a semantic mapping. So looking at the meaning of the terms, but also in syntactic mapping, because we realized that the data was being recorded differently between the two standards. So sometimes you only have the value, sometimes you have the value and the unit in the same field. Um, and so we really wanted to make sure that we address both of those. For the syntax, I'm already going to preface this with saying that what we did is not maybe maybe not ideal and still needs development. And we've been in contact with uh, the Triple SM folks on how to address that a bit better. Um, so yeah, uh, just to let you know ahead of time. And I thought the best way to really showcase how we used the Triple SM framework um, was to talk you through one of the mappings. And in this case, um, it's about a term um, for, or it's about how the different standards in our case, Davin Quarant Mixes, talk about depth measurements. And 
you may know that Davenport actually has a whole lo a whole bunch of terms that address depth, but in this case, I'm only focusing on one of those terms, which is minimum depth in meters. And then on the other standard side, it's just depth. Um, and the first thing that we did was look at how the terms are defined in each of the standard. Um, and for Darwin Core, that was that we are talking about the lesser depth of a range of depth below the locus surface. And already in the definition, it is said that it's in meters. And then for mixes, it's the vertical distance below, below a locus surface. And then um, we also see from the example or uh, from the value syntax, how each standard would like that information to be conveyed. So in the case of Darwin Core, it's just a float. You already know it's in meters because that's in the definition. And then for mixes, you have a float and a unit in the same field. And this is where then the um, simple standard for sharing ontology mappings, triple OSOM, um, comes in. This is a catalog of meta uh, standard metadata elements for the dissemination of mappings between ontology terms. And we're not working with ontology terms here, but it's still a very powerful tool or method um, to talk about how terms relate to each other. And in our case, we have usually with standards, we have the key value pairs. So we're talking about the keys here and um, it very much applies. Uh, okay, so let me talk a bit about what the standard actually is or how, how to use it. And the thing is that everything here is structured in triplets. So you have a subject, a predicate, and an object. Um, and the subject, or let's say the, pro the predicate, defines how the subject and the object relate to each other. Um, this is uh, when you use the triple SRM standard. This is basically the main ingredient that you need. Um, and the way that you denote that is by having a subject label and or a subject ID, um, then a predicate ID and a predicate label and or ID. Um, and so through that, those are like the main components that you need in any triple SRM file. What I've seen now, um, ever since we used it, they have also now included a mapping justification, which is something that wasn't around when we used it yet, um, but definitely something for anyone who's using it now to look out for, because now these are the key ingredients uh, that they mention whenever you create a mapping. Um, just a side note, so when we first used it, I think they had about 23 um, slots, they call them, or well, the terms that you see on the slide now. And I think now they have around 70 or something. Uh, so they are really advancing and making sure, looking at what the community needs and making sure that they provide that in a structured manner. Um, in addition to those key terms, uh, you also have ways to talk about where the sub what the subject source is. So there you could put in uh, the link to the Tedwig term, um, category, the version of the term, um, and all of that, the, how you matched it, uh, when you met, uh, when you performed the mapping, how confident you are in the mapping that you performed, and a comment, which is something that we used a lot, um, explaining what our thinking was behind each of the mappings. And then on top of that, you also have metadata about the metadata. Um, which you can either include in the CSV or TSV where you have um, the mapping or in a YAML file uh, where you have the license, the version, the query maps, um, create IDs and all of that. Okay, so those are all of the different ways which you can use to describe your mapping. Um, but now let's have quickly a closer look at what the predicates are. Um, in our case, we used SCOS predicates, which um, was the recommended way of doing it at the time. But please note that there are also OWL, RDFS, um, or OBO and all alternatives that Traplessor mentions. I just now um, only included the SCOS predicates because those are the ones that I'm using in the example later on. Um, and so you can have a related match where they're just the subject and the object are just associated loosely, um, a close match where they're pretty similar, but not quite yet. 
uh, an exact match, was it, which is uh, what we would hope for in the future in our case, that the terms actually match exactly. And then most of the times we had narrow match or broad match, um, where one is narrower or broader than the other. Okay, so now let's look uh, actually look at an example. Um, so we still have the minimum depth in meters and the depth on the other side. And so now the way we populate it is that we, for the subject, we now actually include um, the name of the term, so minimum depth in meters. And on the other side, um, the IRI to the term doesn't actually have um, words that humans understand, uh, but a numerical identifier, which you can see here. And then below that in the lighter gray, we have the label. Um, and then for predicates, as I mentioned, we decided to use the SCOS um, system. And here we now have um, a broad match between the two. So the object is broader than the subject, uh, which is the case because the subject so the diamond core term addresses a range of depth. And here it specifically asks for the minimum depth of that depth range. And the object, so the mixes term, um, just wants a single depth measurement or a range. It doesn't really specify. So that is a bit broader in concept. And then in green, we're looking at the syntax um, where we can see that one has the float, one has the float and the unit. Um, and again, uh, that was a broad match because, so this is why I'm saying it's maybe suboptical, uh, suboptimal, because it's not as intuitive as we'd like it to be. Uh, but our reasoning here was that the numeric float value in the diamond core field are kind of contained in the more complex alphanumerical string value in the mix mixes field. And that's why the mixes term was broader than uh, the Darwin quarter. Um, yeah, and I think, so that's what I have on the mapping so far. There, um, so Triple SOM has a very detailed resource online, uh, which, well, now I don't have the QR code on the slide anymore, um, but you can easily get that there. Um, and so now I wanted to just kind of uh, come back to the work that we did and some of the other steps that we did besides the mapping to really ensure that what we're doing is bringing value to the community. Um, and so the first thing was to complete this mapping, which we did. Um, and then the second one was to build an extension to any um, to Darwin core for any mixes terms that couldn't be mapped. Um, so, because even though there's some overlap between the uh, two specifications, it's not exactly the same. And what we did here was that uh, we actually got our uh, GBIF colleagues um, to develop a Darwin Core archive um, where they defined the extension. And um, we have a standard set of terms that are now available. And uh, those are also included in I don't know if some of you are familiar with the, oh, no, I'm uh, checking on the word, um, but the overall extension that GBIF now offers for um, any omics data that they have. So they used what we did in our working group to then um, up that and maybe also configure that a bit more for their user groups. Um, but really with the work that we did in the task group within TEDWIG, um, we made sure that what is now being used in GBIF as one of the major data infrastructures is sound and makes sense um, and has a great foundation to build on. Um, and then anyone who's familiar with Darwin Core um, probably also knows of the measurement of fact extension, which is something that we use for um, the terms say, so, oh, well, I maybe should have mentioned that, but Mixus has a core section and then um, environmental packages. And while we were doing our mapping, we only focused on the core section. Um, and so for any of the environmental packages parts, which for example, includes temperature, we then um, opted to use the measurement of fact extension, which is very uh, versatile and adaptable to whatever you add. 
Uh, so that's, in our case, definitely an important um, or a great way of resolving any issues there. Um, and I'm always at the end of the talk now, uh, coming to the last bit, which may actually be the most um, prominent one or the most meaningful of what we did, which was to have this memorandum between the two standards organizations. And I know that in our case, that may have been specific to us that there really was such a large divide between the two standards. But I think in general, looking at the metadata standards where we can see that there are so many coming up, some are endorsed by infrastructure, some aren't, but we need a way to not have any of the burden of translating between the metadata standards on the users, but have that on the standards level itself. Um, and the way that we addressed that was with this memorandum of understanding where we also um, included how this mapping will be maintained and endorsed, where that mapping will be maintained, which is in the Gibway GitHub repository, um, to provide reference implementations on from the standards and make sure that whenever there's a modification in the identifier, um, that that is easily communicated to the other partner um, of this mapping. And in general, when one of the metadata specifications is updated, that then that um, results in an update and then validation of any of the mappings and reference implementations going forward. So that we don't just have this mapping as a point in time, which only worked while we were, for example, on version six of one of the standards, but will continue to be updated as we move forward and as the standards develop. Um, and then uh, something that I also thought would be important to mention is uh, for one, all of this is published. So in case I went through any of it too quickly, you're of course welcome to have a look at the publication. And also in the publication, we included some further recommendations for any tasks groups or interest groups who are going to look at how to map between standards in the future. Um, and now with this interest group, um, or with this group coming together, I think this might be a valuable resource for you guys to maybe not stumble over the same problems that we stumbled on. Um, or also to just give us some feedback and let us know that you found a way better way of resolving things um, where we maybe went in a different direction. But with that, I'd just like to say thank you. And um, Thank you for listening. Thank you to everyone involved. And I'm very open to any of the questions you might have. Well, thank you very much. That was uh, really insightful. Um, at least I wasn't as familiar with Triple SOM uh, uh, in that depth. Uh, I remember when we uh, had the discussion in, in Sofia, and was I was vaguely aware of, of, of the standard. Um, but I wasn't, I didn't know anybody who was using it. And I think somebody in the discussion recommended, uh, yeah, your, your group, uh, uh, at some point at, and, but now in the, in the meantime, um, uh, this, this week in particular, we've seen that like, uh, uh, it's also used by Latim or core and, uh, by, by MITS. So there, there has been some, I'm, I'm not quite sure whether this is something that actually has gained traction in the past year, or I only have discovered it recently that uh, there was uh, some some more uh, adoption within the TEDFIL community than I was aware of. But yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, ben, you have a question. What did, is it, so it's triple S O M? Is, is, that, is that the way? Okay, right? so I actually, I looked it up online and in their first publication, they say it's either, either SSOM or SSSOM, but I know that we had Chris Mungle and the Dungeon uh, who are part of the developing team yeah. within our group, and we just always called it triple SOM, um, okay. which for me at least um, rolls off the tongue a bit more easily. That's but, what we're going with. That, that's it. Yeah, that's what but we're going with. Like, okay, <laughs> in preparation for the talk, I was like, oh, damn, wait, did I say it? wrong the whole time <laughs> but then i knew i couldn't switch now because it's just ingrained in my soul that it's yeah. triple SOM to me um but yeah <laughs> no, sssom is just is just i've been saying it yeah. for a while now and it's terrible so we, we just yeah. let's just go with triple 
Triple S O M. All right. First question yeah. done. Second question is, what did Triple S O M not do well? Like, what are the? Is it because it's a lot, right? And it's just mappings. And so, what are the things that did not perform very well? So one thing that I already mentioned is that at the time while we were doing the mapping, it didn't have a way to capture syntax mappings. Okay. Uh, so it was as um yeah as it had been developed for the ontology terms um where it's mostly about semantics I guess they didn't have a way to address syntax and I know that we had some discussions about including it and there were mixed opinions whether that falls within triple SOM's um just field or not and I don't know uh what the final decision is now so that would be something um that I'd be also interested in seeing. But I think that we managed well enough. Um, so we now always said, okay, so we have um we have just the normal way of talking about the different slots for the semantic one because that's how a triple SM was envisioned. And then when we talked about the syntax, we also we always said uh syntax predicate. Um so that people who were looking at the mapping weren't confused as to what we were talking about when it's in the same file. Uh, but yeah, I think that was one of the biggest um, yeah, hurdles that we ran into. And then generally, it was easy enough to do many-to-one, one-to-many mappings if there was a need for that. Um, yeah. I think that was the main thing. I know that you used it too. Um, so I'd be interested to hear about whether, uh, like, what the major challenges were that you faced. But I also see that David has his hand up. So, yeah, but, uh, Ben, you can so we there. just we just looked at it is is that the fields available to describe mappings in SCOS itself are pretty limited. It, it's mm -hmm. the minimum, but then Triple S O M offered more. And so we took advantage of those extra fields. And then instead of calling it SCOS, we called it triple SOM. That's all we really did. And so we figured there'd be more there, but really it's just, and that's why there are two drop downs, if you see, because you yeah. know, Matt's got, Matt's did them on, Matt has his name there and it's got an ORCID ID and that stuff is not available in the regular SCOS. So we just use it as an extension. Did they see themselves as just an extension or was that the origin of it? Or are they sort of going hmm. beyond that? I think they're separate entities. Um, I think they're just using SCOS as a way to talk about the mappings. That's how I see it. I think they're two, um, yeah, separate groups. Um, but I don't know. Maybe they also moved closer together ever since that I've been more heavily engaged with them. Because it's like, is this, I guess the better way to say that is this, what do they envision themselves as a standalone thing or they only are, only exist within the scope of SCOS itself, meaning that if SCOS didn't exist, they wouldn't exist, like an extension in Darwin Core. If, yeah. if you don't have a Darwin Core record, you can't use it. I think one thing that uh, speaks for them being standalone is that while we were using SCOS predicates, that's not the only one of talking about the only way you can use Triplasm. You can also use OWL um, as predicates or um, RDFSF. Um, and so I think that would be one argument for them being standalone. That leads me quite well into the, one of the questions I had. A, uh, you mentioned in your talk, Jake, that SCOS was the recommendation at the time. Does it mean that you are not sure which is the current re uh, recommendation, or does it mean that they have changed the recommendation since? No, I think um, that was just what we were doing it it seemed the most natural. Yeah. And also with SCOS coming out of W3C, um, we felt a, well quite secure in using that. Um, and now I think it's just, I, I'm even, I feel like our, um, the OWL options and RDFS were already available at the time when we used it, but while we were having the discussions about um, which predicates to go with, which is like, okay, SCOS makes sense here. Uh, so let's go with that one. Okay. Uh, um, and yeah, so I don't think that they necessarily changed um, what they're recommending. It's just that they have a breadth of options available and then you can look at what comes the most natural for the set of terms that you're describing. Okay, good. 
And then the other question is like, how long did the entire process take from the kind of like the, the idea, yeah, we should do something about this to, okay, we now have the finished mapping and uh, I don't know, the publication submitted or something like that. Okay, um, so I think the, the period of time where the task group was properly active was a bit less than a year. And we had bi-weekly meetings, so every two weeks, I think. Um, and a lot of that was talking about, talking through the mappings. And of course, first of all, getting organized and all of that. And then towards the end, writing the task group report. Um, and then it took, I think, another half a year to a year until the memorandum of understanding was signed. Maybe half a year. Oh, maybe. Well, yeah, ish. Um, and then it took a bit longer still uh, to get the publication going. But that was on me because I'm I was doing my PhD at the time. I'm still doing uh, the PhD. I'm now in the final phases, uh, but just other stuff came up and I knew we had the report ready to go. Uh, so whenever people asked us about it, I could send them the report. It just wasn't a peer reviewed publication yet. And then at one point I sat down and was like, okay, let's prioritize this. This is actually important. Um, was which is something that I now again see with this group coming together. That it was a really good decision to make sure that we have that properly published and not just as a document floating around somewhere. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, one more question. You mentioned that for the uh I think it was the example of the temperature we referenced the extension for measurement and fact. And mm -hmm. you had this you, the, the yes. screenshot or, or, or a graphic there was like, um, okay, temperature is uh, corresponding here. And uh, so if, did I read this correctly that it is possible to express those conditional clauses saying, okay, this field is equal to this field if the related field has a specific value wait let me i think it was around slide 45 That's yeah let me um okay you see that now yeah yeah that one okay okay great um i'm just leaving it in this view because i'm not sure yeah, sure, sure. when i switch to slide five. um here it was actually that or what do you mean about the condition uh well so, so we we have some uh, mix uh, seven hundred forty two means temperature, I assume. Yes, that means That's temperature. The value for temperature, and then is it possible to do uh, like a mapping for the for the field saying okay, um, uh, if uh, this field is equal to Darwin core measurement value, if Darwin core measurement type equals temperature. Oh, yeah. oh, that is something that we did not think about. We just offered that as because these were or the package that included temperature was something that we didn't address as part of the oh, main okay. thing. And so we still wanted to make sure that there was a way to use that with Davencore. Hmm. Um, and so the way that we went about that was looking at the measurement of fact extension and seeing that that has the potential to capture all of the terms. So in our case, the mixed environmental package, for example, also includes uh, nitrogen measurements, oxygen measurements, and all of that. And that is very easily expressed with the uh, measurement of fact terms. But it wasn't that we said, okay, but the measurement type would then have to be temperature. It's more that we said, okay, this is how you express the very simple value of, or well, it depends yeah. because here you have, well, it's it's not actually that uh, simple if you want to parse it and you don't know whether a unit yeah. is included or not. So one could argue that the Darwin core one is simpler, um, but what looks uh, at first sight to be a very simple value of just 17 degrees Celsius, how you can split that up and describe it using the Darwin core. Um, measurement of fact extension. Oh, okay. So this then required the data, uh, the person who puts in the data to put in temperature themselves and all of this information. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Well, I guess uh, for many of those special cases, it, uh, uh, yeah, it does require at some point human input to to do like the proper I don't know, data conversion or whatever. Uh, but this particular case for like, as I like to call them, like conditional mappings, um, yeah. uh, uh, is is something that um, I've seen a couple of times, and in particular. Uh, uh, yeah, with the, my background from from ABCD, uh, one of the really clear examples is the the mapping between uh, ABCD and Darwin Core mm -hmm. for the higher taxonomies. Um, so Darwin Core has uh, dedicated fields for the higher levels, for instance, family, whereas uh, ABCD has just a, a, a bundle of terms called um, a, a higher taxon. Yeah, uh, and then you have higher tax on name and higher tax on rank. And so you have to, the, the name of the family goes into higher tax on name and higher tax on rank is then, it uses the Latin names, but familia. So this, uh, 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 everybody, so, so even at the lowest level, if you want a, a simple conversion of an ABC to Darwin Core or the vice versa, uh, you have to take this into account. And uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, why I was like, particular uh, uh, interested to see how did you approach this particular example? Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Your turn. Mm. Also to this topic, you showed um, that, yeah, that the mixed temperature is one term and in, in Darwin Core it is five. Um, do you consider that one mapping or five different but linked mappings? How, how did you approach that? That's a good question. In this case, we didn't have that as part of the main mapping. So we just said, well, as part of the extension, you can use measurement of fact to describe anything else that isn't covered by um, the mapping that we performed or the uh, Davenport archive extension that we created. And for anything, um, like that, we then offer the measurement of fact extension. So we didn't think about um, if that was one mapping. I, now looking at it, I would say that would be a one to many mappings. So that you, yeah, taking the mixes term where you have 17 degrees Celsius in one field and you map um, that to multiple terms and in the Darwin core world. If you wanted to talk about it in the mapping sense, I think that's how so I would, would, would kind of get one ID and then it would be a one to many um, object or yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Matthias, do you want to uh, go a bit further on, on your comment in the chat? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm pretty new to triple SOM. I tried to use it to um, map MITs to Darwin Core. So we could mm -hmm. apply the MITs elements to Darwin Core and then easily make um, measures for it. And yeah, we also ran into these problems with trying to sort of structure more complicated logic in it which is not always that, that easy and also this issue of having this one to many mappings which are related so we well for the more conditional mapping that didn't effectively materialize but i was thinking of using some sort of pre-processing to make that happen which like well in this case you don't really need it but it could be a regular expression or could be just the string has to equal temperature or something like that but I couldn't figure out how to actually effectively implement this into a triple SOM mapping. So that didn't materialize, but yeah. maybe you have an idea or maybe you did experiment with it. I don't know. I don't think we experimented with that. I'm just uh, having a look at it now. I think, okay. So, do I understand correctly? Sorry, just because I'm just looking at it now, uh, that it means that you could, for example, for the temperature case, or no, let's stick with the depth case, where you, for Darwin Core, had um, 
just the the value and not the unit in the field, but for mixes you had the value and the unit that you could add a node to the mixes term and say pre-processing separate value and unit. Okay. I think, well, I, I certainly think that that's a powerful way of maybe making it a bit easier. If you can't nudge the standards to go in the same direction, um, then at least as on the data user side, um, you can make sure that you know how to parse any data that comes in. But we didn't use it, so I'm sorry that I can't give any better recommendations on that. Yeah, well, just to also clarify, um, I'm not sure that this is how it is supposed to work. It was just something that I was willing to try out. Okay. And I'm, yeah, just looking around, hoping to get feedback from the people who have used it before. Um, and maybe it is more flexible than I, I think it is. But yeah, just to <laughs> ensure that people don't consider this like an authoritative statement for, for, for my part or something that that is how it's supposed to be used. This is how I think it could be used. I'm not really sure about that. Um, but also for the one too many mappings, mm -hmm. which are related, we did have that. And I used uh, the subject match field or object match field. I forgot which one um, to link these up. So to make, if you have multiple mappings for a single subject, then you explicitly specify in this field which ones are connected to each other so that may be a solution for uh, what Yuta was saying I'm not sure if you you worked with that I didn't think I'm not actually sure if that was around when we did the work um but definitely something that I'll pass on to who's now maintaining the mapping to make sure that with the new version that's included because that's a, yeah, that would be a great way of structuring it and making sure that you see all of the mappings that are available for a certain term. Yeah. Um, and maybe uh, just on, um, yeah, just generally any questions regarding SM? I already mentioned to David that it might be worth um, maybe in one of the next meetings or so with a bit more time uh, to let them know, to invite some of the SM developers to a call to make sure that we have someone who can just answer all of our specific requests. Because everything that I can do is talk about what we did and what worked for us and how I think that things have now changed. Um, but yeah, I think maybe that would be beneficial at one point. Um. Um, Raisa, have, can you say anything about um, the uptake or the uses that the mapping has had since pu being published? Uh, the main use or the main uptake, I would say, is uh, that from GBIF and OBIS um, for their DNA-derived data extension. So that is based um, on the mapping that we performed here. Um, and I think that has the biggest impact or it has had the biggest impact on, um, yeah, now being able to actually include sequencing data into OBIS and GBIF, which so, was previously only in other databases. So all the, the con conversions, let's say, if um, GBIF is structuring their data in one way, um, mm -hmm. The, they're doing the conversions themselves in, in like, say, if they have, like, with the temperature, uh, or no, let's say with the depth that, okay, we'll take any depth that's in feet and do the conversion as we put it into the into the GBIF store. Is that what's happening? I think so. Um, I'm, now that you're asking, I'm not exactly sure with the mapping, but I know that it's part of the extension. Um that would be something that I'd have to, have to ask Tim. Like how they exactly <laughs> implemented it now. Um, but I always, I understood it in the way that you could now come with a mix as compliant metadata sheet, give them that, and they'd be able to understand it and convert it into Darwin Core, which is what they normally use. Is there another repository, another data integrator that the Mixus data publishers are um, pushing data to? 
Um, the main one would be the INSTC um, or the, so there's uh, for sequencing data, there's the International Nucleotide Database Sequ uh, Nucleotide Sequence Database Collaboration, INSTC, which has three instances, um, yeah, one in know. Europe, one in Japan, America. and one in America. Um, and those are using the MESA standard for uh, the metadata. But as far as I know, they haven't uh, used the mapping to be able to also use Darwin Core compliant data. So, the, yeah. Thank you. Wonderful presentation. Um, I, I, would you be willing to share your slides um, yes. on that presentation? Yes. That, w that would yeah. be something that... Um, could go into this into our um, repository or something for or at least to, to be able to reference them so. yeah no i'd be happy to i can um they're google slides so i can add a link to the notes document i suppose perfect yeah, sure. yeah. Oh, uh, there... realizing i don't have the link to the notes document because i came in late oh sorry <laughs> that's uh of course. You will in a second. Yeah, I have it here. Uh, One more question. You said, I think someone else is maintaining the mappings now, not you? Yes. Uh, so it's the, um, from the Darwin Core side, it's the Darwin Core Maintenance Group. And from the Mixer side, it's the Mixer's Technical Nanana Group. Um, and uh, yeah, we have representatives from both of them come together in a meeting, talk about how they're going to let each other know what there's an update in the standard and all of that. Um, and yeah, I don't think that there's an updated version of the standard yet, because at the time they were waiting for an update in the map, uh, in the standard to then, or one of the major updates in the standard to then be able to do a proper update of the mapping to save a bit of work, um, but yeah. You, so you have a name very... from the Mixer side? Mm, Ramona Waltz. Oh, Ramona, okay, excellent. Um, and then John, John Victoria, from yeah. the David Core side. Thank you. Of course. Are there any other questions to Isa? If not, then I think we can go on in the agenda. This uh, this took a little bit longer than I expected, but that's uh, completely fine because it was a really interesting talk and, and a lively discussion. So uh, uh, that is time well spent, and uh, I don't care if you uh, I have to to postpone some of the other agenda items. Uh, so uh, thank you again for for joining. Um, so next on the agenda, I have a couple of housekeeping things, uh, updates uh, from or, or since the last meeting. Uh, at least they were not specifically uh, referenced in the uh, in the later uh, agenda points. Uh, and so in the last time during the discussion of the charter, we also had then a, a discussion about the license. And um, uh, Ben has brought this into the executive committee. Uh, it came back to, came back to, to the comment that like the... Um, the note in the, in the uh, um, document, the Tedric Exeter Committee has stipulated that by default, Tedric producers uh, product of Tedric uh, will use the Creative Commons CC BY license. And uh, so we, we had then went off into a discussion on whether we should uh, change this to CC0 for our group uh, um, or if the, the, the stipulation is more of a no, it, it, really needs to have the, the, the buy clause in there. And uh, uh, Ben or Stan, do you want to say something about this? Uh, quick summary from the discussion and the, the other channel. Yeah, so our discussion stalled after the holidays. And um, but right before that, I was, um, you know, casting about and looking what other groups are doing. And it it seems that in many cases, um, CC BY is being used 
um, although it's not really being enforced and people don't really seem to care. So <laughs> it's it's kind of like a lot of uh, much ado about not much. Um, <laughs> so um, so we we kind of I I think maybe settled on um, CC by um, even though our spirit is really in CC zero. Uh, we're trying to minimize the friction uh, between standards and and when we're using and we're all using a linked data sort of a framework that our our credits are are being um, you know published their attribution is being being published along with the use itself with a reference to the standard itself. So um, anyway, um, I don't think we have a definitive resolution of this yet then so another way to think about this too is that you know it may be the spirit of cc0 but you know the one of the common complaints and common concerns about publishing data is attribution right um you hear it from people all the time and so as a as a community-wide strategy it would be, make sense to put together things and make decisions based where we can advance that and sort of mitigate that concern and so without compromising anything. And so, you know, CC0 for the data, but the CCBY, it is a creative work. People are writing these things. And so you'd like people to um, use them and incite them accordingly. It's also, like I have buddies that are digital patent attorneys. We're not really, this is this is really <laughs> minor. I mean, it gets like, it can get very serious. You know, I mean, it's all kinds of stuff. And so, and, and having done that for an institution, been responsible for picking out licenses and all these kinds of things and dealing with like privacy laws, all these kinds of things, this is very minor. And so, but but you think it is important as a strategy is concerned to make sure that at least we're encouraging people to give citations. And then that way we're also addressing those concerns from publishers about publishing their data itself. So. Yuta, you raised your hand. Right. Um, the question orig originated because um, it's a group between um, Spinach, uh, BHL, and Tadwick. Um, a group of us were working from the publishing side, ours, um, side about uh, copyright of data and um, ideas and concepts. And Patricia is part of the group um, too. And our, so we, we were differentiating between the legal requirements um, that are originating from copyright and then um, scientific best practices and community norms. And so one of the outcomes is that these are two very two very different things. And um, yeah, so that that was one of the origins and just not not having a license. Um, or yeah, doesn't mean that you don't need to uh, or shouldn't attribute because that is just what our, what our community does and it's also what uh, is scientific best, best practice. So that's kind of like um, part of the background. Um, yeah, and I hand over to Patricia. Yeah, I was just to add that this is Mainly, I think, a, a misunderstanding because TEDWIC is not about data at all. Standard TEDWIC is standards, procedures, it's a documentation, it's text that can be seen as publications, even if not in a journal, where it's normal to put CC by, but we never put any license on any data that people would fill in using the standards or anything. So this has absolutely nothing to do with copyright on any data. So I don't think there is any uh, contradiction here. And just with my head on being in EOSC for the exact same thing that Ben said, to not lose the community and all the, the they're really speaking of data and content they want to mobilize they officially stated uh, anything is considered open if it's CC0, CC BY, or CC BY share alike. 
but it's only if you put uh, non-deviation or non-commercial use that they consider it as not being fit for open science because that they find really too restrictive. But the other licenses are just for citation or uh, share alike, making sure that if they decide that it's openly usable, nobody can come uh, and make something with the data and decide to change the license and close it. So if it's open, it has to remain open. And if you reuse it, you cannot decide to change the license and suddenly close the data because you modified them or you use them for other purposes. So they find share alike even a protection to keep the data open and prevent that third users close them because we didn't put that the license should be share alike. So that's the position of EOSC. And with that compromise, we managed to keep many contributors in the system that if we put everything on CC0, we would have lost them. And I think GBIF also still allows uh, CC by exactly for the same reasons. Yeah, uh, good point that this is kind of um, uh, the different approach from uh, coming from data producers or coming from, from content coming from within Tedwig. Um, um okay so so much uh oh, oh, oh one more thing in case you haven't noticed like the, this discussion after the last meeting then continued a bit in in our slack channel but then eventually moved into a new uh, a slack channel uh called i think copyright and licenses copyright and licensing uh so if if you uh if want to get updates on on that topic or or, or uh, at anything there that hasn't been discussed yet, uh, um, you can subscribe to that channel in the Tedwig stack space. Mm. And going back to the to the other agenda item, oh yeah, right, the the other task that uh, uh, yeah uh, I was given and or, uh, after the last uh, meeting was to create uh, or, or actually ask Stan to to create. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, Tedrick, uh, a Slack, uh, sorry, a GitHub repository for our group, and this has been created. And uh, link is is here, so from now on we can put uh, the uh, outcomes of our group there. Uh, we still need to discuss on, on how to structure this and then uh, 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 capture the the different work that is going on. Uh, uh, but it is there for now. Um, Already in the last meeting, we also discussed to have a contributors file in there, so people who contributed to that uh, to the work of this task group uh, can add their names there, and um, also, yeah, with the context of the licensing discussion, to to give some some attribution, even if the the documents themselves uh, might even yeah be put under um, under CC zero by by the group of people creating them. Um, I, I think the, the I think the standard was you who wrote this licensing sentence in in the the draft agenda in, in the first place. Um, the, the the main idea behind this sentence was just to make people aware uh, uh, that uh, if you want to contribute here, it will be published uh, under CC uh, uh, license, and um, so that people uh, at some point say, "Oh, wait, wait, wait! That's not what I." What I wanted, uh, um, yeah. But last time the discussion from this group turned in the other direction. Say why only CC by and not CC zero. So uh, I think we are we are good in that regard. Um, oh, and one more thing that is that didn't put on the agenda, but also belongs here. Uh, prior to this meeting, I got an email from Holly, and because her department head or co head, if if I remember correctly. Uh, uh, is leaving a position she's currently um yeah taking on a lot of new responsibilities and for that she said that uh yeah she would like to withdraw her position as the um co-convener of this group um and she she still wants to be part of the group 
uh, uh, but um, yeah, uh, with a bit reduced responsibility. Um, so since the next agenda item is um, uh, uh, the, the charter, I was wondering whether there's anybody else from this group, maybe particular of the people who've uh, been at those discussions in, in the last uh, few meetings as well, who would like to step up as a co-convener as well. Um, I, I wanted to ask Jason, but he already left. <laughs> he had a good timing for that. <laughs> uh, uh, no, it, but we can leave that since, I mean, we have agreed uh, uh, as a group just to kind of rotate the responsibilities of, of hosting those meetings anyway and, and doing the, the, uh, the organization uh, things like um, uh, sending out the uh, doodles and invitations and so on. Um, yeah, which brings me to the next point of the agenda looking at the time we will not have the time to, to properly go through this just wanted to since also we discussed this a lot in the last meeting and I uh, try to put in all of the changes and discussion points uh, uh, from the um, uh, where we just at some points only wrote notes on the side and, and uh, wanted to put them in here uh, Ben I think I need screen sharing oh no I can sorry uh, probably have that um, um, that should be the correct window. Yes, yes. Um, so, um, wrong kind of zoom. Uh, okay. Um, so yeah, so this document uh, as Holly asked for uh, she will not be on the convener list oh, anymore. Um, uh, so the motivation hasn't changed. This is largely from the um, uh, uh, the, 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 the session abstract for the uh, mapping session at the last static. Um, and uh, but I think that yeah the goals outputs and outcomes that I have refined a bit um, and I'm, I think I'm for those parts I'm I'm quickly reading the the important parts just to get everybody up to speed. Um, the tasks of this task group can be grouped into three steps that co that correspond to the envisioned mapping process. Uh, at first, mappings are created by the standard creators. Then they are expressed in a common format, and based on this, they can be documented on the TEDBIC website. The order of these tasks and deliverables described here does not follow these three steps uh, in order, as we consider the decision of a unified way to express mappings as the first and most important step, as both the tasks relating to the mapping creations and the mapping documentation depend on that outcome. Mm. And um, and I made a little graphic of, of those three parts. So we have that the mapping creation part and the center mapping expression and then mapping documentation. And um, each, corresponding to each of those are the um, deliverables that are then yeah, mapped to the different tasks. Task one, uh, assessment of current mappings in Tedwig. The group will assess which TEDRIC standards currently provide mappings to other standards, both within TEDRIC and external, and how those mappings are expressed. And like, what is the current state? And for that, the deliverable will be a report on, on what we've gathered. Um, task two, uh, overview of mapping practices. The group will assess common ways of expressing mappings, both within TEDRIC and external ones, and review their advantages and disadvantages. Um, and that depends on the first task. And again, have like a, a small report where we put those. Uh, and then based on this, um, the group will create recommendations for the tag on how TEDVIC standards should document their existing mappings, both in terms of human readability and machine readability. 
even if different standards require different ways of expressing the mappings, the integration into the standards page, pages should be comparable. Um, and then also within the task, also, yeah, the, so again, uh, a recommendation report uh, to the tag uh, where uh, we select one or more mappings um, as the preferred way. Uh, and a recommendation on how those mappings should be expressed on the website. Um, and then for the uh, support for standard creators, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, the group will support standard creators and maintainers to create mappings by giving guidelines and re guidelines and recommendation and recommending tools, sorry, and or workflows on how to create and use mappings. And there we have five, uh, we have three deliverables, um, a support document for standard creators on how to create mappings based on the recommendations from deliverable three, including examples or links to existing mappings that use particular features. Then deliverable six, um, and this is a task that was given to us from the technical architecture group that has been on, on their list also prior to the formation of this group, but because it fits so well within the topic here, uh, we, we said uh, that's, uh, that, yeah, we will take this on, even though it's not a high priority, um, uh, a guideline to decide on cases if a new term for a new standard should be created or mapping to, uh, and mapped to existing similar terms or an existing term should be borrowed from the external standard. And then uh, lastly, um, a list of recommended tools or workflows uh, in the GitHub repository of the task group with short description and links to external resources. Um, so yeah, um, those were the discussions from the, uh, sorry, uh, from the last uh, uh, meetings. And in terms of, of the strategy, I think the first parts are pretty much unchanged, um, but um, um, here we had some rephrasing strategy for or how ongoing work will be managed and maintained over time, leadership, system, and sustainability, um, and that we have, that I've extended a bit more here. During the meetings, the group will break tasks into subtasks, define intermediate steps, assign responsibilities, and follow up on previous step. It can be adjusted and it can ex adjust and extend the tasks and deliverables outlined in paragraph here if the need arises. The work of this group, as with most uh, TEDRI groups, is open by default. Outputs such as minutes from the meetings, deliverables, etc., will be published on the GitHub repository of this group under uh, the TEDRI organization account. The ongoing work on the different tasks will also be made available there. And the primary channel of communi communication outside of the virtual meetings will be the discussion channel mappings between standards on the TEDRIC Slack space. And uh, I think here for the, for the other sections, I haven't really changed that much. Again, discussion channel, uh, everybody is invited to participate. Um, uh, you can email us if you have any questions or things you don't want to discuss in the Stack Channel. Um, and for updates, it's recommended to subscribe to the repository of the group um, now that it is there. Uh, everybody who has a, a GitHub account, uh, yeah, subscribe to it and you will be informed for updates. And of course, you can also uh, volunteer to uh, host one of the upcoming meetings uh, with all of the responsibilities that... Uh, go along with that. And uh, historic context and summary are unchanged. Are there any questions or comments regarding this agenda, uh, in particular the changes? Raisa. Uh, my one question would be um, why you decided to have the primary communication or the capture the discussion in the Slack channel instead of uh, the GitHub issue tracker. 
because I assume that that would be more readily available for people who are just looking around because for Slack, I think you'd have to be invited. Yeah, that that that's a good point. Uh, the distinguishing between the issue trackers. Yeah, we, we haven't really put much effort on the issue trackers here. Um, um, I mean, you have the the meeting reports, so I guess that would be a way of people learning about the work that you're doing and also learning about how the discussions are taking place. But mm. yeah, no, no, you you're right for for the for the task and 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 like particular topic related things the, the issue trackers would, would also work quite well um we put the, the slack channel in there because it was kind of like the the first um communication of this group um that this group had outside of, of uh, us sitting in a circle uh, in sofia um uh during that meeting i think uh yeah uh, i had to leave early but uh, uh stan might have been you that you were asking. Uh, somebody created the the, the uh, Slack channel in the the main Tedvik space um, to uh, continue the discussion there. And this it just has been the the um, central point of discussion so far. Um, but yeah, that, it's a good point because the Slack channel by default is not open. Um, I mean, as far as I know, everybody who wants to be invited gets an invite. But uh, yeah. It's yeah. it's not openly searchable and findable. Yeah, we just we're just conducting so much business in Slack, <laughs> yeah. um, and people are finding it very convenient. Um, and not everything that so I, I we haven't made much use of the GitHub discussion boards or discussion feature. Um, I know they did some with the Latimer Core. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, anyway, like, like David said, if you want to be involved in, uh, in discussion, that's not really, um, focused on a particular issue, even just basic management stuff, like, um, Hey, our next meeting is going to be at this time or here's a doodle poll or something like that. Uh, those are the kinds of things that are getting tossed around in Slack. Um, yeah, I, I think for that, it definitely makes sense to also have the Slack channel. And now thinking maybe for some of the discussions about uh, the different mapping options or anything like that, one could additionally have, or one could open an issue on GitHub and then send a message to Slack saying, hey, I opened an issue here. Um, because I do see the problem of people not readily checking GitHub or maybe not even having an account. Um, yeah, that's mostly just about making it more accessible for people who haven't heard of it before. But I, if that stifles the work that you're doing, then stick to Slack. I feel like that's the most important thing to get the work done and to find the communications tool that works best for you. It was more of a just uh, rec <laughs> recommendation or... No, no. Uh, the, with, within the different groups of, of Tedvik, the... Uh, their work style really diff varies uh, quite strongly. Uh, some are like primarily email focused. Others have uh, uh, weekly meetings. Others uh, uh, have their their announcements on work done through the GitHub issues. Uh, so it's uh, yeah, uh, uh, they are all different kinds of uh, um, working styles uh, uh, present. And so it's it's a good point. And um, yeah, uh, I in, in terms of uh, yeah, for for open communications, I really agree, and uh, but at the other end, it's like the Slack channel just works at the moment, and uh, so it's it's good to to have something that we already have a, a general agreement on. Um, may, maybe we can do some some of the uh, yeah put in a paragraph there um, to um, to split this out a bit, and and for um, yeah. Uh, for other things, we we use the GitHub issues. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, any other uh, input on that comment from from the other participants? Um, I think the charter is in pretty good shape. Um, if you, I think you know, we can go ahead and and submit that 
you know, sort of clean it up, take out the yep. the uh, instructions and um, basically submit it to the executive. And I think they will be very happy with it unless, you know, unless anybody has any other aspects they want to work on. I think it's I think it's in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. I, I think I will, I will uh, just at least mention the the, uh, the issue trackers uh, because we uh, so we uh, on, on the meeting and on Tuesday we also uh, uh, updated the uh, the Slack uh, sorry the <laughs> charter for for the ABCD maintenance group and and we we had some explicit traces for for the the uh, GitHub issues there um, and then I think I would uh, yeah finish it up and. Uh, uh, Put it in, put it in in this like maybe also open up a ticket for like a, a last chance to to comment or change. And if it's like after a week there's no input or, or no disagreement on that, uh, then uh, uh, we will uh, go on and 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 uh, yeah, see it as agreed uh, upon by the group. So standard procedure is to get that into Markdown and we post that on the Tadwig website. Um, there yeah. will be some um, some jiggering that I'm going to have to do because um, you know where to find this. You know, this is a task group, but it's a task group of the tag, which is yeah, but anyway. Yeah, yeah, it's it'll be we, a little bit complicated, but um, we, I, we I already like had it. we already had discussion uh, like in the previous session of 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 mids where it's kind of like the the, diff, the two different parts of the. Uh, the task group, input group, and mentors group uh, uh, on the one page, and on the other page, the the page for the for the uh, uh, functional subcommittees, uh, and yeah, uh, how to to get that in there. Uh, so uh, we'll I'll probably do a duplication of sorts from the 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 tag, I think, and just so that it's nested properly in the right place and and where people would tend to look for task groups, which is over in our community exactly. community page. Yeah, yeah. Oh, speaking of which, um, one more question for Raisa. Um, so you gave the setup for the mapping from the perspective of one standard, subject, predicate, object. What is the symmetry? How is that uh, mapped? Yeah, so that was because we only mapped in that direction. Um, if you wanted to then do a mapping from Mixus to Davincourt, you would have the Mixus term as the subject the and the Davincourt term as the object. So you just uh, switch those around. And then if you have either narrow or broad match, you would also flip those. Uh, for I think for any of the other exact match, the predicate would stay the same. Um, Close match, I think, was the other one that would also stay the same. Um, but yeah, one could probably do that uh, programmatically. But in our case, that was the priority that we had to have it from Darwin Core to Mixers. And so that was what we focused on. So there's no infrastructure for that. There's no, in, in the, the, con the conceptualizing of the, the mapping process there's no capability for just automatically inverting things not that i have seen you know and, and really having it truly sit there in the middle and mm -hmm. work in both directions there it, it should be easy enough to do uh, but <laughs> i haven't seen it <laughs> that's all i can say yeah okay cool thanks okay. yeah of course I unfortunately have to run, uh, but I'm really excited okay. to see what this group will do. I think the charter looks great. And thank yeah. you for having me. Okay. Bye. Thank you. And yeah, uh, people are leaving and uh, yeah. Uh, um, I, I have maybe a general this. question. Some mm -hmm. a phenomenon that I noticed, but uh, that is trivial, I think, for mapping between Tedwick standards and for those being in Tedwick. But when I was working with groups to map Tedwig standards against external standards, I noticed a phenomenon with the standards that tend to have more and more extension that the domain-specific uh, people working there try to find their happiness or their uh, 
term to map in the extension, and they completely forget that there is uh, a core uh, part. And sometimes the terms they are looking for are in the the core uh, ABCD or Darwin core uh, standard, but they keep looking for them in the extension. And then they get worked up because they think it doesn't exist. And then I, I often said, but yes, but these are common terms or uh, even if they are from your domain, we already taught before. And in the extension are only new terms that are not in the, the main part, but systematically, especially now with the AFG and other extension, they think everything they need for their domain needs to be in this extension and they forget the rest. So I don't know if you noticed this happening too with groups you worked with or if it was only me. I I just haven't really worked with other, like guiding other people to mapping. So um, I cannot really talk about that. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but but it's 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 a good uh, uh, yeah observation to to have in mind also for, uh, when it comes later to the recommendations for the people doing the mappings that uh, uh, for, for for the workflows uh, what can we do to mm -hmm. yeah keep those efforts focused. Mm -hmm. uh, it happened in... more with ABCD because ABCD itself it's already very big and has uh, yeah. a lot of terms there. And uh, so the extension brings, of course, for DNA and earth science things, but they can find already a lot in the, the main standards. And yeah, that's something they don't realize. OK, well, thank you. Um, I guess the, the rest of the agenda points we postpone to the next meeting. And um, yeah, I guess we will figure out uh, when is a good point to host this? Um, we, we already had this discussion in, in the chat group earlier today uh, when it comes to people contributing from all over the world. And I, I just looked at the list of people who are in, in the Slack channel. We have at least two Australians uh, in there. So if, if they want to participate, we have the same issue then with the tech that it's really hard to find a time um, uh, where that works for, for all time zones. Um, and yeah, at the moment, it's still there's like this one vaguely suitable hour um, uh, for, oh, I just had it open somewhere here, yeah, sorry. Uh, 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 that is, uh, hold on. Um, uh, uh, yeah, at, uh, if it's uh, yeah at, at nine in in the evening in, in Central Europe, then it's uh, uh, seven in the morning in uh, 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 yeah on the east coast of Australia, and then for the uh, uh, for the US they sit firmly in the afternoon someplace. And so in that case, it doesn't also doesn't really matter that the, the US switches to daylight savings time before the before Europe because they are just <laughs> in the middle. Whereas if, if we want to have an opportunity to to meet within this like golden hour while it still exists, uh, then it has to be done in the next meeting should be done in March. And at the moment, we are more like every two or three months. That would mean the next meeting would be in about a month. Uh, a bit of feedback, is, is this too early or should we... Um, uh, should we go ahead and aim for an end of March meeting? I think so. If I it. think uh, that I'm watching this new GitHub group, will I receive yeah. the invitations? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I think so yes. far I was not on the group. So. Well, you, you you can join the Slack channel, mm -hmm. and then then you mm -hmm. certainly receive it. But now that we have the group, I will also um. Uh, uh, try to remember to to uh, post the announcements for the upcoming meetings there. Um, and just so no way. for the it. others, I get them via GitHub. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, just create it as as a as a ticket there, and then people are informed as well. Mm -hmm. so All right, then. With regard to um, hmm? meeting, um, yeah. 
you outlined quite a, a, a large list of deliverables and um, also the topics that you're spanning is very wide and it's, I, it's a, I mean, it's not a small task. So my experience is that like, so yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of like, what are your experiences um, with meeting frequencies? Because like meeting every month, two or three months, um, I wonder, like my impression is that, that would take many years um, to cover all that you described. Um, what I found is that thing, like, things move, move forward when you meet every week or every two weeks. So I'm, com I, I'm completely fine with, with whatever you, you choose. Mm. I'm just kind of like wondering a little bit about your, like what kind of time horizon do you have? Uh, that that's a good point to we haven't really discussed this yet so uh and um uh i think that like the the first two no actually three tasks so they're, they're just the recommendation for a central uh, uh standard for documentation and i think with a uh, triple som we already now have quite a good candidate uh we, we still should see how other uh, what other ways are, are, are done within tedwig uh, um but um, yeah, that should be like the, the first mm -hmm. core deliverable and um, or the, 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 yeah, the first real big mass step. And uh, I'm, I'm realistic that it's, it's not going to happen uh, prior to the next Tedwick meeting. Um, and my, my idea was that maybe um, we, uh, uh, if we, we like, uh, start to organizing the, the work a bit more strategically and uh, create uh, some task and, and, and small responsibilities that we then work with uh, uh, smaller groups uh, and we say, okay, well, I don't know. Um, so one, one idea that was learning one was to uh, cre just create a, a short survey to be sent to the different uh, uh, maintainers of the Tedrix standard say, just do you have any mappings? How do they look? What do you have? Something like that. And so we could, I don't know, have three people that, that come together and say, okay, we just prepare the, the form for that survey. We don't need to have uh, seven or 20 people in that discussion. Uh, uh, and we don't need to, to yeah, uh, organize across so many time zones if we have like a small flexible group. So uh, my thought, without having discussed it with anybody, was to, uh, uh, to have the, the bigger meetings to, to give like the general uh, director and priorities and then break it into smaller chunks and have uh, uh, smaller independent teams work on that. And then people might also be able to to choose their, their own uh, topics that, that are more in their, their personal interest and say, okay, I know that, uh, I don't know, that deliverable five is not really a priority yet, but I really want to work on that because this is also related to some of my other work that I'm doing. So, uh, yeah. This, this was kind of my idea for that. But now, since we haven't really started it, that also is, is another good point to have the next meeting uh, uh, not too far away to start on that process. All right, then thank you for being here, all of you, and for staying a bit longer. Um, wish you all a happy night, evening, afternoon, morning, uh, <laughs> depending on your time zone. And uh, I'll uh, see you around at uh, my maybe next meeting or we will read each other online. Okay. Yes, thank you, David. Thank you. Bye bye. And bye. thanks, Ben, for the efforts, <laughs> the recording and everything. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>